I'm Andrew White. I direct the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. So welcome to the New School. I'm, uh, I'm one of those freaks who loves the snow, and, uh, <laughs> except when it messes, messes up good plans, and it doesn't seem to have had any damage, done any damage here. So thanks for coming out. Um, the Center for New York City Affairs aims to drive innovation in social policy and to improve the effectiveness of government and other organizations in their work with low-income urban communities. Uh, you can read more about our work on our website, centernyc.org. But one of our core areas is public education. And our research and reporting on how the schools serve or fail to serve the city's young people has included assessments of Chancellor Joel Klein's school accountability methods and of the city's massive experiment in school choice. And last year, we became the publisher of InsideSchools.org, which was founded at Advocates for Children. Yeah. <laughs> which was founded at Advocates for Children nearly a decade ago by Clara Hemphill and her colleagues. Um, and Pam Wheaton, who's also on our staff now. Um, and they're both, Clara's been with the new school now for two years. Pam just joined us. Inside Schools provides parents and the rest of us with independent assessments of every public school in the city, as well as a wealth of information on how to maneuver the bureaucracy, how to um, understand the sometimes not understandable, and also has an incredible forum that I find fascinating for so many parents and teachers and others to be having discussions about what's happening in their schools and across the system. Today we're diving into some of the most heated topics of the political moment. We're going to be talking about school reform and how to deal with struggling schools, teacher quality, how to manage change with organized labor in the public sector, and how to deal with the fiscal crisis, among other things. There's a number, there are a number of contradictions and, and frayed seams in the current conventional wisdom that we'll be talking about today. Everywhere we turn, there's criticism of government and of public sector workers, and there's talk about dialing back on benefits and job security. And at the same time, there's these endless lamentations about how America's schools aren't performing up to the schools of Asia and Scandinavia and, and other parts of the world. I gotta say, there was a time when I looked at my friends in the, uh, who had become teachers and sort of envied them for their pensions and <laughs> job security. And I uh, thought, wow, if I had only planned ahead, look where I could be in a few years, have my own pension in a lot of years. Um, but I gotta say, today I'm not so sure. We, who knows where these benefits and pensions are gonna be 10, 15, 20 years from now. And the truth is, many taxpayers are not exactly thrilled with the bills that they're paying for their schools and other public services. New York City is in many ways more fortunate than most other places where the bulk of school funding rests on property owners and on their taxes, on their school property taxes. In New York, at least, the burden is shared across the city's revenue stream of a number of different taxes, many of which are progressive taxes and fall most heavily on wealthy New Yorkers. But the issues facing city schools are in fact statewide issues because city government pays less than half the cost of the city's schools. Much of the rest comes from the state. More than eight billion of an $18 billion budget comes from the state, depending on how you look at the numbers. That's if you don't include the long-term costs of pensions and so on. So when the state government starts talking about slashing spending, the city's schools are unavoidably right there, preparing to receive a blow. But for New York City's families and neighborhoods, the schools don't live in some kind of special isolation. They're, they are core institutions. And a lot of the work we've been doing at the center is to try and figure out how to make the schools more formally core to the, uh, the infrastructure of support for families and, and, and young people in their neighborhoods. Um, we really want to make sure, I think part of our core to our mission is to make sure that young people in New York don't suffer the, the damage that can be done by severe poverty at the rates that we've seen in past years. So some of that work has had very productive involvement of a number of community organizations and also the involvement of the United Federation of Teachers and its president, Michael Mulgrew. Um, so I'm very pleased to have him here to speak. We're going to have um, Mr. Mulgrew give a talk for 20, 25 minutes. And then we're going to have three reporters up front who I'll introduce in a little while and they will 
throw some questions his way. Later in the session, we'll have time for Q&A uh, from you all. And uh, we'll finish off right around 11.30. So I'm looking forward to a very productive discussion. Michael Mulgrew is from Staten Island. He's a longtime teacher who worked at William E. Grady High School in Brooklyn, and then went on to be a leader on career and technical education within the union. He became UFT president a year and a half ago. I'm very pleased to introduce Michael Mulgrew. Excuse me while I set this all up. Thank you all for coming. I'm getting used to this New York weather now. How about everybody else? It's so nice all the time. I heard this morning it was going to rain, and lo and behold, it's snowing again. I have an eight-foot high snowbank in front of my house, and I don't know where I'm going to put this one. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and a word of advice, never plan to give a speech the day after the State of the Union address. <laughs> I get home last night at 10 o'clock and, uh, and this morning, and all I get to watch on every station, it seems, is a complete analysis of every tick word and every way the president looked, every word he said, analyzed to death from 360 degree angle. Very, makes you feel so comfortable to come out and give a speech after this. But here I am. So thank you for taking, uh, for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you this morning. At the start of a new school year, at the start of a new year and a new decade, with a brand new chancellor in, a, in charge of our city schools, it's an appropriate time to take stock of where we are, evaluate the performance of our school system, learn from our mistakes, build on what works, and fix what doesn't. Making public education more effective is something, is something that we all want, and we know that it is imperative to the future of our city, particularly this time of economic hardship. We have spent billions of dollars on our schools under mayoral control, and the return on the investment has not been as great as it should have been. Far too much energy and time and far too many resources have been spent in recent years on misguided strategies and ancillary issues. Decisions were made for political or ideological reasons or out of pure hubris instead of what was right for children. Now, as we continue to move through this economic crisis, it's time to focus on the fundamentals. That means paying closer attention to our schools showing signs of trouble, fixing problems before they get worse, and paying attention to the needs of each and every school community. We cannot afford financially or otherwise to continue to give up on our schools at the first sign of trouble. That is not what teachers do with their students, that is not what families do with their children, and that is not what the Department of Education be, should be doing with our schools. Schools have already endured repeated rounds of budget cuts, cuts that have reduced or eliminated subjects, programs, after-school help, and many other services. Reduced school budgets have led to the attrition of over 4,300 teachers and 700 other educators in the past two years alone, and they have not been replaced that represents nearly 6% of the teaching force, and we have all seen the effects as class sizes have soared throughout the city. I propose that the system start now to eliminate all non-essential contracts, such as the $5 million it spends on the new teacher project to recruit teachers even when there are no vacancies. It should then institute an immediate review of outside contracts like those that require us to spend $120 million a year on questionable IT consultants and equipment. Even if contracts are deemed to be necessary, we should immediately start to renegotiate all of, all of the outside contracts and consultants. The goal should be an across-the-board reduction of at least 5% on all of those contracts and the consultants who are now being paid by the city taxpayers. Budgeting and school management are two areas where the Department of Ed's performance has been abysmal. The system has been roiled by constant change over the past eight years. But at the same time, management and oversight of that change has been subpar. Management is what the mayor says our new chancellor knows best. Well, as a teacher, what I know best are schools and classrooms, and what they are about and what they need. And I'm here to tell you and tell the new chancellor 
that there is a lot of room for improvement. Right now, the DOE treats schools as islands, failing to both accurately measure and monitor progress. The word accountability is a favorite at Tweed. Principal accountability, school about accountability, teacher accountability. But what about the DOE's accountability to the schools and the public? The DOE's job is to run the school system, support the schools, assess what the problems are, provide the right supports. Instead, what the DOE has done is turned the schools over to individual principals and said, you're on your own. That's not management, that's called abdication. At the same time, while we, they are washing their hands of the basic work of education, they decided to bet the farm on the test scores. And that's where the losses have piled up. Former Chancellor Klein and the mayor repeatedly boasted about their data-driven approach to measure how well students and teachers were doing. Principals of elementary and middle schools fearing for their jobs focused all the attention on test preparation in reading and math to the detriment of basic subjects like history and science and not to mention art and music. And at first, particularly on the state test, the strategy seemed to be working. Mayor Bloomberg and Chancellor Klein could not stop congratulating themselves. The mayor even went to Washington, D.C. to proclaim that the system was making strong progress in the horrendous racial achievement gap. Too bad it all turned out not to be true. There were warning signs. Even though the state test scores were skyrocketing, the scores that experts regard as the most reliable, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP, told a very different story. According to NAEP, scores were rising much more slowly, if at all. The day of reckoning came when the state contracted and for an outside review of the test conducted by Harvard University expert, Dr. Daniel Koretz, he found that the range, of narrow, the range of knowledge was so narrow and the questions so predictable that the results for students and schools across this state were virtually useless. If outside experts could see this coming, why did the mayor and the chancellor not heed the warning signs that everyone else was, saw? Remember that those nearly useless test scores were used to make a number of high stakes decisions. Which students to promote, school progress report grades, teacher bonuses, the creation and retention of charter schools, the list goes on and on. You begin to see that when the underlying premise is so completely flawed, everything else is at risk. And that is where we are right now. So how do we fix this? The test scores have been recalibrated. New York State has signed on to the Common Core Standards, a set of shared high standards intended to prevent the kind of dumbing down we have seen across this country as a result of No Child Left Behind. Assessments and curriculum to reflect the Common Core Standards are currently being developed. But there's something we can do in New York City starting right now. It's time to change the school progress reports. They must reflect the actual work that is going on in a school, much more than test scores, and they must be accurate. Just because data is being collected does not mean it is accurate. A comprehensive, well-designed school progress report should provide a valid roadmap to success for each and every school. Before I was president of this union, one of my responsibilities was school safety. A colleague, uh, my colleague at the Department of Ed at that point was a woman named Rose DePinto. Rose, who sadly retired years ago, understood that you could not judge a school from a data report sitting at a desk at, in Tweed. She would invariably go to schools. Actually, she constantly went to schools to do what she said was a review to see if what a school was safe or not safe. And she would walk into the building and principals very nicely would say, oh, Mr. Pinto, it's very nice to see you here, and say, could you come this way to the conference room? And Rose said, we'll get to the conference room later. If you want me to go this way, I'm going that way. <laughs> and it wasn't a gotcha moment. She wasn't there to try to say what the school was doing wrong. Rose constantly said, if you really want to understand how to help a school, you have to go to the school. You can look at data. But in order for me to give the guidance and support that a school needs, 
I need to be there in the building seeing what is actually going on. And that it was, is what the Department of Ed needs to get back to. But the school progress reports are not the only things that are broken. The benchmarks used by the Department of Education to close a school are arbitrarily enforced moving targets. There is no clear-cut reasoning behind closure decisions. We need clear, reasonable, and consistent benchmarks and interventions that take place when benchmarks are not reached. That's why I am proposing an early warning system to help alleviate this problem. We envision a set of triggers for schools that begin to show signs of weakness. Trigger one is when there is a troubling number in a data report some, at somewhere, such as a rise in the dropout rate or a spike in chronic absenteeism. This phase would include the formation of an internal school committee under the direction of the principal to focus on each of the troubling issues and develop a plan for improvement of them. Trigger two happens if there has been no progress after a prescribed amount of time. During this phase, a team from the Department of Education would come into schools regularly to work with the administrators and teachers to strengthen the interventions or to recommend other supports and programs. Trigger three occurs if the school continues to stagnate after the first two interventions. At this stage, schools could be slated for closure, or if there are glimmers of progress placed in a, reform of, in a form of receivership where the school is under the direct control of the Department of Education. An early warning system alone will not fix our struggling schools, but it, be, it can begin to reorient the Department of Ed towards doing that hard work of supporting schools rather than just branding them a failure and closing them. But at the same time, much of what goes wrong in a struggling school isn't too hard to figure out. In a majority of these schools, there are large numbers of high-need students and overly large numbers of cl uh, in classes. Both of these issue issues need to be discussed. The DOE's admission and enrollment policies have been the subject of much debate and criticism over the years. These policies have led to severely overcrowded schools with a significant lack of attention paid to large populations of students who enroll throughout the school year from other schools and often from different countries. We call these students over-the-counter students. And that doesn't even, even cover the significant population of students who have been improperly promoted due to the debt test score inflations. At the same time, students with special needs have struggled to get the services and therapies they require. Due to the rigid rules of the Children's First Networks, they are often placed in schools that cannot support them, but are prevented from getting these services at a school that might be right across the street or down the block. A couple of examples. DeWitt Clinton High School. The last large high school on the west side of the Bronx has been hit by a surge of high-need students. Between 2005 and 2010, the special education population has increased 37 percent. The homeless population has increased 350 percent. There are 700 English language learners and over 620 students in special education, over half, half of which are in intensive self-contained classrooms. I can assure you that if the Department of Ed does not intervene to help this school support and support them in their challenges, this school will soon be seen on a closure list. PS332 in Brooklyn, a school that has seen its fair share of challenges in recent years. The Department of Ed placed dozens more homeless children, bypassing other nearby schools in the process. Predictably, the school's struggles have worsened and the DOE is now trying to close it. Both of these schools repeatedly asked for additional help from the Department of Education, and all of their requests fell upon deaf ears. So let's try to get the students in the right schools in the first place. How is it that even when a, we have a wide, wide range of applicants with a wide range of abilities, some schools end up receiving a disproportionate number of the most challenging students? Without the proper transparency, we can't know the answers to these questions. Admissions and enrollments should be audited by an independent outside entity. The transparency and oversight would help improve the process and prevent students from falling through the cracks. 
At the same time, we also must create programs for improperly promoted students, a huge problem in the wake of the test score debacle. We need to get these students back on track right now. We can begin by determining their specific needs and developing personalized programs that re-engage them and keep them attending school regularly. The DOE recently recognized this problem and announced that 42,000 students that fall into this category would be helped. A good first step, but it leaves 58,000 students behind. Class size at the majority of our struggling schools are disproportionately large. At the same time, class time for subjects other than English and math have been reduced, thus limiting the tools that teachers have to engage their students and provide them with a well-rounded education. Combine that with a spike in chronic absenteeism and with the reduction of programs for special needs students, and you have what is fast becoming an unmanageable situation. Right now, we have a large pool of educators called the absent teacher reserves, or ATRs, as you as they are normally referred to. These teachers are working in schools. What they don't have, through no fault of their own, are permanent placements within a particular school. These highly qualified, hardworking group of teachers that the Tweed constantly rails against is purely a creation of the DOE's own misguided policies and management. The ATR pool was a contract demand from the city in 2005, which they have not managed correctly. There are urgent needs we can address by redeploying these teachers. For example, we can place them in our most overcrowded schools. Doing so would make a dent in the rising class size numbers across all the grades in this city, a problem that the DOE has exacerbated by redirecting over $750 million in state class size reduction to other projects in recent years. We also have more than 150 guidance counselors, 56 social workers, 25 psychologists, and five attendance teachers in the ATR pool. We need to band these much needed professionals into a form of a SWAT team to serve the schools most at risk. We need them to be able to use their skills to help the children, which is what they want to do. Wouldn't it be nice if a place like PS332 could get a few, extra social, a few extra social workers deployed there to help them with all of the children who are currently living in homeless shelters. Instead, the DOE and city would rather rail against these educators and use them as political pawn in this tough economic time. But at the heart of everything, each school, whether it's struggling, thriving, or muddling through, needs a rigorous, well-rounded curriculum that engages students and brings out the best in teachers. Yet in the last several years, the focus on testing in English and mathematics to the exclusion of so many other subjects and skills have damaged the future of hundreds of thousands of students. As I mentioned earlier, new assessments and curriculum are under development for the Common Core Standards, but that is only for English and mathematics. Let's do more. We can do more. I challenge Chancellor Black to appoint a working group that includes practitioners and teachers for the development of a well-rounded, high-quality, rigorous curriculum and instructional practices in the arts, foreign language, science, social studies, and all other subjects for all grade levels. If she were to do that, it would be a gift to our children and a sign to our city's educators that she takes what they do seriously. Because as anyone who has followed the school system closely over the past eight years know, the strained relationship between the city's educators and this administration is a shadow on our city's future. One of the most important steps Chancellor Black can take in her new position is to end the constant attacks on the teachers started by her predecessor. Unfortunately, so far, the new chancellor seems to be singing from the same songbook. We already know that nearly a third of the teachers leave this system before the DOE even gets a chance to grant them tenure, and nearly 50% leave before the end of the sixth school, their sixth school year. And struggling, unstable schools are difficult to staff in the first place and tend to see a great deal more churn among teachers than other schools. But when the chancellor and the mayor constantly take shots at veteran teachers as if having many years of experience is a bad thing, it discourages educators from wanting to make teaching their life's work. 
and the DOE exacerbates this situation with their fair student funding formula that penalizes principals for hiring and retaining experienced teachers. This practice must stop because it hurts children and it's bad for schools. The teaching profession is enhanced by both new teachers brimming with enthusiasm and veteran teachers whose wisdom, experience, helps their newer colleagues. I was a carpenter before I was a teacher. And when I went to William E. Grady in Brooklyn to teach English and film, I thought it was going to be a breeze. And I am here to tell you, I would not be here today if it were not for the help of a veteran teacher. Teaching at-risk students at the high school level, they don't listen. <laughs> All teachers find out that walking into a classroom with the best intentions does not make classroom management all of a sudden magically happen, no matter what level you teach at. And it took me three months, because I am very stubborn, till finally a te this teacher, who I shared a room with, said, are you ready for some pointers now? <laughs> I reluctantly agreed, and I started to learn the nuances of the craft of teaching. And that is something that is missing, and we need to be able to develop more of those relationships in this school system. If Chancellor Black wants to be successful, she has to take a very different path from her predecessor and understand you cannot manage the largest, most complex school, most complex school system in, in America with buzzwords and bromides. This union has been around for 50 years, always trying to do the important work of making schools better for the children that we serve. And we will still be here long after Mayor Bloomberg and Ch Chancellor Black are footnotes in history. Attacks and lip service don't help move the system forward. It is always about what happens inside of the classroom. That is what will move this school system forward. Educating our children is hard work and painstaking and frustrating, but it is also deeply rewarding. And that doesn't lend itself to simple solutions. And, if, and it works best when all of the players on the team work together, listen to, and respect each other. I thank you all for coming here today. Thank you for that. Um, now I want to invite our, our uh, panelists or our, our questioners up to the front. And Michael, why don't you have a seat up there as well? Um, Clara Hemphill will sort of help guide this while she also takes part in, in the discussion. Clara is senior editor at the Center for New York City Affairs and project director for InsideSchools.org. She uh, was a reporter at Newsday for many years and has written a number of books about the city's schools. Errol Lewis is host of Inside City Hall on New York One, a job he took fairly recently after many years as a columnist and editorial board member at the Daily News and host of a great show on WWRL, which I sorely miss. Uh, and Juan Gonzalez is a columnist at the New York Daily News and a co-host of Democracy Now. He's been a, a formidable part of New York's uh, journalism community for, for many years and um, is known for taking a stance that is a little different from much of the rest of the stuff you read in the Daily News. So <laughs> we're gonna... <laughs> So I want to say, you know, after, after we have this conversation up front, there's going to be time for Q&A in the audience. We're going to have a couple of people walking around with microphones. So please hold your hands up in a little while, and they'll come around and try and get to as many of you as you can. And then at the very end of this, after we close, we're going to have time for people, if they want to be interviewed for Inside Schools on camera in the back there. We're streaming this live on our website right now. So at, after the end of the forum, we're going to be able to do a bit more of that um, in terms of just one-on-one -on -one discussion. Clara. Um, hi. I, I, I'm not sure how to be, how I moderate myself, Andrew. Is, yeah, <laughs> if I get out of line, I'll try to rein myself in. Um, uh, but the, um, uh, this is the first um, 
time that we've had a forum here at the Center for New York City Affairs since Inside School's arrival, um, mm -hmm. which uh, Pam and I are very happy to be sharing an office and uh, working together with uh, Jackie uh, Wayans, who is uh, waving in the back there. Um, we've, we've redesigned, we're working on a redesign of the website, and one of the new features is that it's a lot easier to send in comments now than it used to be. So I want to encourage all of you who are public school parents or teachers or just knowledgeable about the schools to send us, uh, to, to log on to a school that you know about and send us a comment. Um, uh, we'd appreciate that very much. Um, I'm going to open this by um, uh, asking um, uh, Mr. Mulgu about the, the schools that are um, failing and I, or that are, that are struggling. And mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, I've been to DeWitt Clinton, and I certainly know that that um, has been swamped by um, hundreds of very uh, needy kids. Um, there are also schools that are struggling not because they have too many kids, but because the leadership is bad and the um, uh, teachers are entrenched and not willing to change. And a lot of some of these schools are actually losing population rather than gaining them as, uh, uh, as parents um, vote with their feet um, and leave the schools. Um, so do you say that it's just the Department of Ed that is, I mean, what, what should the Department of Ed do about schools where there is, in fact, very, um, a, a lot of resistance to change and doing things in a different way? I mean, I agree with you that some of the schools are swamped by needy kids, mm -hmm. but sometimes that's an effect rather than the cause. My, uh, my current frustration is that what I hear from the Department of Ed is I will walk into a building and maybe observe what you just have observed, and tell, their response to me would be that the school's good, it gets a B. And I continually say, why don't we visit schools together and really engage in a meaningful conversation about what is actually going on here? And if things are entrenched, then... It doesn't matter if because their test scores are at this certain level, you know, according to your progress report, but there's a problem here, and we should say there's a problem and start using that early warning system that says things have to start changing here. And we've closed schools in New York City for, I don't know, 25 years. And it's only under this administration that it's gotten all of this publicity. I, I, I don't think anyone ever envisioned that you would have a chancellor trumpeting the fact that they're closing schools. It used to be done in a way where people would go in and recognize what you just were speaking about. There's a problem here, and you need to change. And you would tell the staff, it's time to change. If the, staff if the school continued down the path it was going, then we would work with the Department of Ed and close the building. And, but it's really about moving education forward. And when I speak about curriculum, and I've been reading reports under these... Um, the state joint intervention team visits, they're called JITs, and I'm seeing that over and over in the schools they're visiting, they're saying there is no curriculum. I don't, can't fathom the fact that a whole school won't, won't have curriculum because then if things are stagnated, what are we supposed to be basing telling the teacher, look, here's your curriculum, you're supposed to be working off of this, this is how it works. And if you're not, then we have to have a discussion because there's a problem here. So when schools are struggling and stagnated, I think it's a responsibility to first recognize it and then go in, which I'd be more than willing to do with anyone, and say to the staff, look, it's time for a change. So if, and I've seen so many schools change, and you know, in high schools, I worked with small learning communities, and we went into a lot of large schools, and we, tra uh, we didn't close the school, we broke, broke them into communities. And there was always reluctance by a, pop, a segment of the teaching population at first, but after, after we started moving it, it went along. So it's really about process, and if it can be done, and people do move. I mean, remember, teachers get into this profession because they want to make a difference in kids' lives. And if you point out the work they're doing isn't working, I find they move. Juan. Um, Mike, I want to ask you a, sort of a broader question, because uh, I listened to your speech, and I think you, you had a lot of good uh, uh, points there. But Thank you. somehow I felt that was missing sort of What's the, what's the real story that's going on right now in public education in the city? And I, I say that because 
I grew up in New York City. I went to public schools. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the old centralization system plus the reform decentralization system plus the new centralization system. Uh, so I know that uh, I know a little bit about how these schools have developed over the years, and it's clear that something major is happening. But there's a it's like people are looking at at two different worlds. One world says, hey, look at the great progress. The other world says, look, the public school system is falling apart. It's being totally, dramatically dismantled. Uh, and I'm not quite sure where the UFT is on this issue, because while you criticize the administration, I want to remind you that in 2005, your predecessor mm -hmm. uh, at the UFT mm -hmm. cut a deal with Mayor Bloomberg at, just before the election in order uh, for Bloomberg to prevent the UFT from backing a, an opponent of his uh, in order to get a better pension benefit. That was largely the biggest thing you got out of that contract, a better pension benefit for your members. Uh, and so I see that on the one hand, you're critical of the, of the administration, but on the other hand, many times the UFT doesn't really explain what is happening in public education in a way that the average New Yorker can understand it. And I'd like you to respond to that. Okay. What I see is, as we open, as this administration's opening new schools, many of them are highly successful schools. We also understand that they have much lower percentages of high need students. So I was an at-risk teacher my entire career. So that's very troubling to me. So if education, moving an education system has to be about moving an education system for all of the students. When you trumpet that everything is great, look what we're doing, and it's clear that we have patterns of students who are absolutely being shuttered into certain schools and not getting what they need, then I will be highly critical of it. The new schools that they have open, some of them, as I've clearly said, are doing very well. But the issue here, the big education reform issue across this country is how do we move education, especially for the neediest students? That's the one issue people have not figured out. Now, David Steiner, our state education department commissioner, he, I was with him yesterday, and he says, look, this is very, we have to go th with very, three simple things have to be put in place that people, it's not sexy, but people don't want to talk about. One, we, he understands that you have to have a curriculum. <coughs> You have to have an evaluation t system that is much more transparent, it's constructive, and it's fair. And you have to combine that with a process for teachers, uh, the 3028 process, that is expedited, which is what we agreed to last year on our rubber room deal. And the third thing he said is uh, that no matter what we do, we have to give each school the ability to customize instruction to the needs of the students that it has. So when you ask me what is the big question about where is the UFT on education, that's where I am as the president of the UFT on education. It's how do we move the system for all of the students. Politically with the mayor, you know, it changes from month to month. Uh, is that the, I guess that would be the, the fairest way to say it at this point. We want to always find ways to work with the uh, administration because that makes it easier to try to make the changes in schools that we're trying to get. Um, that hasn't been going so well lately, <laughs> at all. And, you know, in 2005, when that contract was signed with the other things, we were still, at, they were still at the phase of, they had the ability at that point to create new schools and keep them moving forward. Now we know that the, they're actually closing some of the schools they create because they've reached the tipping point of they can't just keep the high need students out of the schools they've created. So they've gone past the tipping point. And now we're dealing with this as the reality of the system is, okay, you did that one, you did that part of it, but what are we gonna do now? You're past your tipping point. That strategy won't work any further because you now have to deal with the big question, high need students, how are we gonna educate them for their future and for the future of the city? Well, the administration would say that the charter schools are doing that. That, for instance, that they are in the in the in, in Harlem. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in a uh, uh, they're in the the, the uh, in the South Bronx, and they are addressing in a way that was not 
the school system could not do uh, on, under the onerous union contracts and yeah. all, all the other problems that, that the school system has that the charter schools are doing that. Do you agree? No, I don't agree with that at all. Uh, you know, last year when we passed, when we were in Albany on this legislation, it was clear to us from the enrollment patterns that they were not enrolling the highest need students in the areas where they were. And we said, y here we go again, those, the neediest students, nobody is addressing them. And let's just say what it is. You know, we have a large portion of children living in homeless shelters in New York City. I know the administration doesn't like anyone talking about children, doesn't like anyone talking about children in homeless shelters. We're close to 17,000 now. That's an all-time high since they've kept this record, since they, they've been watching this number. Uh, the number of English language learners is beyond anything we have ever had in this school system, and it is a very difficult population. Before, we, you know, after the third year of NCLB, the statewide graduation rate for ELL students, newcomers who came in uh, at high school age, was 8%. Now, we have small international schools who do a good job with it, so what, why isn't an international school now working with DeWitt Clinton where you have 700 English language learners? The school is completely being swamped. They do not have the resources or the programs to help these students. And uh, we've spoken with the Department of Ed, we've implored them, w will you please set up a system where we can start training the teachers in these schools who might not have ESL certificates with people, with teachers from the small international schools because we know their programs are working and we need to get that training there. So I do not agree with them that the charter schools are fulfilling the need of the highest need students in this city. Errol? Um, Mike, you opened with um, a, a, a very reasonable assessment that for, uh, despite the amount of money that's been put into the school system since Bloomberg took office, uh, the return on investment has not been what it should be. Mm -hmm. But during those Bloomberg years, uh, teacher salaries went up by about 40%. What would you say to the public um, about what the return on that investment has been? Part of it is, was in uh, return for time, more time being spent in the building. Where the investment went wrong was all of the changes, their major reforms have only been on structure. We need to have a reform based on instruction which we have not had in this city. That is what will make the difference. You can keep playing with structure, you can reorganize again and again and again. You know, there's been three official major reorganizations and I don't know how many uh, unofficial reorganizations. That's not gonna fix the system right now. It was, it, it, there were things in the structure that were wrong, but it still comes down to what happens inside of that classroom. And we need to have a system that is really pushing instruction in a way that education has not done before in this country. And I would say if we were investing in that rather than co continuing to waste money on restructuring, and I'm, I understand they are going to restructure again shortly, uh, that's still not helping the teacher inside of the classroom. That's, you know, why do we still lose the 50% of the teachers? When we ask them, they always tell us the same thing lack of support, and this is a much harder profession than I ever imagined it would be. Those are always the two answers. And could you imagine a profession where, 60, where you lose 50% after they go through six years of college? We are not the Navy SEALs. You should not have an attrition rate of 50%. And, you, and it's an amazing, when you walk into a school where I've walked into schools and teach, you know, principals, I meet so much with the principal. The principal will tell me, my job is to help my teachers help their students. And I see that that's a school where those teachers don't leave. It could be some of these schools are in the hardest uh, sections of this city, yet those teachers will not leave. And that's what you need to start replicating throughout the system. Because you have there, you have these schools where it is a culture of support for the teacher, and then the teacher takes that same culture and does everything in their power with the right support to help the children. That's where we, the money has been misguided, and we need to now funnel more of the funding towards doing those things. Well, I, I'm not going to hold you responsible for what your predecessor said, but when asked why so many teachers were leaving the system, your predecessor, the president of the UFT, said it was because of pay. Right, and she, she 
brought out all of the charts, and she said that they, they can do better in suburban systems, and they can do better in California, mm -hmm. they can do better everywhere. They got a 40% bump. Now, so now if taxpayers have anteed up, we're almost a decade after the fact, and now you're saying that, well, despite that, there's still something wrong, and now it's a new problem? Well, even in this tough economic climate, we're still losing them. And they've had the bump in pay, as you, as you say. And they used to, we did, we did track this before, and actually, you know, we used to get the phone calls from Long Island and Westchester saying, now that you've trained them, we're taking them. It was very nice of them. I like that they get our tax money, too. But um, if you know that in this tough economic climate, you're still losing them. They're still leaving, and what you need, what we do, is ask them why they're leaving, and this is the, the reasons they tell us are always the same too, as I said before. My understanding was that the teacher turnover rates had actually declined. They've gone down slightly. They're not. They've gone down, but you're still looking at fifty percent in six years. I, I thought they had declined, but it, yeah, it used to be fifty percent in five years. Ah, okay. Um, so they have <laughs> technically declined. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, absent teacher reserve pool. ATRs. ATRs. Okay. Uh, d I guess we're among policy wonks here. We can say Everybody ATRs. knows ATR? Yeah. Um, okay. The, the, I mean, you described them as um, uh, hardworking, dedicated uh, people, and I'm sure many of them are, and you say that they've lost their jobs through their, their permanent positions through no fault of their own, and I'm sure that's the case as well. However, um, many principals tell me that they have uh, requested, had asked these ATR teachers to come in for interviews many times, that they called 15, 16, 20 different teachers in the ATR pool, and they can't even get them to come in for interviews. So I just wonder whether um, uh, this is a bigger problem than you're suggesting. It's the teachers in the ATR pool are so frustrated and angry right now, it is not a healthy environment for anyone. Um, they, their stance, some of them, are I have been hired by the Department of Education. We don't get hired by schools. The issue that there are so many of them is clearly uh, has been mismanaged by the Department of Education. This was something they said they wanted and they could manage. The effects on these teachers, uh, the disrespect that they feel, has a lot to do with some of the anger that they have. But that is why there is nothing right now stopping the Department of Ed, nothing, from permanently putting them in positions in schools where there would be no interviews necessary. They could target the teachers by license into the schools by need, and they could do that right now. They have, I have told them to do this, they have refused to do it for ideological reasons. The principals, when the principals now are clear that they said we, it, there are all sorts of problems with the formula, with budget cuts, we are not hiring ATRs because uh, they're not new teachers. When there, was, uh, when there was a program that made up some of that money, the principals would always tell us that just because the program's there now doesn't mean the Department of Ed will change their policy and leave us hanging. So I think it's, I, as I said in the speech, think it's time to Michael, really redeploy them uh, just, by Just need. to understand, when you say they're not new teachers, you're saying that they're more expensive for the individual principals to hire? Absolutely. Okay. When they changed, look, this fair student funding was designed, and you can look back at the, I'm sure somebody filmed the press conference and the press release, the whole idea of changing all of the funding formula was the mayor and the chancellor said we needed to drive the more experienced teachers to the hardest schools. Because at that point, they were looking at the data, as it still shows them, but they don't talk about it, that more experienced teachers get better test results. It didn't work. We now have the least experienced teachers in larger numbers in our hardest to staff schools. So if the premise for changing fair, uh, to a fair student funding formula, I, we all love their catchwords at all times, was to drive teachers, the more experienced teachers, to these harder to staff schools hasn't worked, why would you continue the policy? I mean, even in Washington, D.C., they did it for one year and said, this doesn't work, and they switched back to what's called average teacher salary, that you charge every school for an average teacher salary. 
and then you make it up plus or minus based on the years of experience. So this way, a, dis a principle is not based on the very real decision of if I hire this teacher, this might mean I don't have the money to provide for a program that I want to do after school. And that is what they face right now. I think the idea was that the um, higher income neighborhoods were actually getting a lot more money mm -hmm. in, their, in their school budget because they tended to get more senior teachers. Yes, so because that, it would And that be, was considered unfair. The, the system was set up that uh, every school was allotted an average teacher salary for a position. After the beds went in October 31st when schools settled for the year, in terms of how their programs would run, the schools with more experienced teachers would be sent uh, additional money, and the schools who didn't have the more experienced teachers would take money out of their budget because they spent less on their teachers. It was We told them it wasn't going to work then, and it should really be an incentivized program, and we should be able to get that done because this hasn't worked, and this policy of charging a school for what a teacher actually costs is a disservice to the principals and to the teachers. I'd like to ask you about this whole, you were mentioning experienced versus inexperienced teachers. I'd like to talk about uh, experienced versus inexperienced principals. Um, yeah. <laughs> about 10 years ago, there was 1,000 schools and maybe 1,000 principals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now we got about 1,000 schools and about 1,600 principals, <laughs> except that now all the little schools are, you know, three or four schools in one school, in one building. Compartmentalized uh, uh, education. Last year, a good friend of mine uh, who's a parent activist called me up very upset. Uh, she has like a 21-year-old daughter who has a fiancé, and the fiancé had just started teaching, and he came home one day, uh, and he told his future mother-in-law, I'm going to go be a principal, uh, uh, and um, I'm going to uh, go to this program, I think it was at Harvard or someplace like that, they're going to train me, they're going to pay me, and I'm going to come back and be a principal. And she says, this kid's not even married, he doesn't have any kids, <laughs> you know, he's been in his school for two years, and he's going to be a principal. Uh, and this is happening. <laughs> this is happening all over the place. That yep. people, young kids out of college who don't even have kids are running schools. And I'm trying to understand how this happened, how you, why your union hasn't raised more ruckus about the fact that these folks are not experienced enough to be in charge of six or 700 kids. You know, I mean, there's, there's an exception once in a while, but not on a general basis. So you, you're going to reform a school system with kids? Uh, and, uh, or, you know, metaphorically speaking, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't hear you say anything about this. Uh, I think uh, the main program you're talking about is the Leadership Academy here in New York City. Um, basically, if you want to become a principal, you need to go to the Leadership Academy. And we know that the first year, the Leadership Academy uh, only took people who were not in education. It was a prerequisite that you weren't in education. So we understand how this administration feels about educational experience. Um, it's a real problem. With all of the other things we're dealing with, maybe it is something we should be talking about more. We see more and more scandals being written about in individual schools. Um, there's been a couple just in the last uh, week and a half. I mean, you see horrendous things happening. Uh, parents uh, with teachers have uh, stood up in different in every borough at different times to try to get principals out. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it never works because of what the parents and the teachers' concerns are. Um, we had the case of uh, PS 114 in Brooklyn, where for four years the parents and the teachers said this principal is destroying our school. The Department of Ed said the school's getting a B every year. The school is good, and she's a great principal and she was mismanaging the school horrendously, and she's one of the principals you, you would be referring to. They finally removed her under a, um, all sorts of investigations, uh, but you don't need investigations if the entire school community is telling you this person is destroying our school. She was removing all of the programs that made their school a great school. This school is a one of the foundational schools in Canarsie. And it was always a good school. We didn't need a progress report that said they got to be every year to tell us it was a good school. The parents knew it, which is why they were outraged about it. Uh, we, maybe we need to do more of that. Uh, there is a problem with the fact that when somebody has a B, a C, or an A uh, on their school progress report, that does not shield them and should not be a shield for them that says that they cannot be questioned about what they're doing inside of a school building. Because when we wait 
And now we're dealing with the fact that PS114 uh, now it received a D finally. When they finally removed the principal, it received a D. And after one D on the first, first time it ever received a D, the Department of Ed slated a foreclosure. And, you know, and the school's response is, you got to be kidding me. And they said, well, we're going to fight you, and we're going to try to put our programs back. And they actually, I had to go out there because they went to the school. I went to the school. They're trying to hire their math and literacy coaches back. And the Department of Ed told them, you don't have the money because you're, the principal we removed overspent, and you guys are in debt to us for $200,000. They said, we told you she was doing it, and you didn't remove her. And now you're telling our, us we can't do the things we know works for our kids. So it is something we should look. You're right. We should focus on it more. It is a bigger problem. We have so many issues out there. And we're close to 1,700 principals now. We're close to 1,700. And by and large, almost all of them have to go through the training at the Leadership Academy. And as we know, there is no training at the Leadership Academy about, it's sad to say, there's nothing about education there. It's only about management. So you're right. We should do more on it. You said um, in, in your speech that um, the devolution of power to the principals represented abdication by the, the, the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, though, you, you say that to know what's going on in a school, you've got to be in the hallways, you've got to be there every day. Who better than the principal to do that? The, the principal should be doing it. But it does not mean that the Department of Education gets abdication from that responsibility. I'm not telling someone from the Department of Ed to be in there every day, but they should be visiting the schools. You can hear from the schools slated for the closure list this year, you will hear all of those communities tell you the first time we saw a Department of Ed official was when they came in here to tell us they're closing us. Where were we when we said there were problems when we needed certain programs or help? Where were they then? And you just left the principal there. Some of them liked their principals. Some of them said their principals are the cause of it. So. It really comes down to, is, this, is the question here, what you're bringing to me is, does the Department of Ed has the responsibility, have a responsibility to actually monitor schools on a timely basis to actually check to see what is going on, good or bad? And if things are good, there's always room for improvement. So when we talk about schools, everybody says, uh, Mogu talks a lot about closing schools. It, it's so frustrating right now. I can walk into a school with high-need students, and you know they need a lot of things to work with those high-need students. But I also work into to schools where all of the students are on grade level or a little bit above it, and they're still only teaching to the test. Those schools should be putting, this Department of Ed should be helping those schools accelerate education for those students. But they don't do that either. And the principal says, my only concern is to make sure that those test scores are right because that's the only thing I am being judged upon. So that means that we have now really lowered the bar so much for our school system because it is a shame that we're not accelerating programs and we're not doing more because we do have hundreds of really great schools and we have schools where kids are really doing great things and we're limiting now their ability and access to go further faster. And that's part of this abdication of responsibility on behalf of the DOE because they'll just sit back. Wouldn't it be nice if you have a good school, somebody visits, and they go, you know what? We're going to get some people in here. We're going to put an accelerated science lab program in your building because you're doing really well on science. Wouldn't that be nice? But they don't do that. That's gone. It's, you can't say everything was wrong with the old system. There were things working. But this reluctance to say that their job is only to manage accountability is doing a disservice. I want to get back to the uh, absent uh, teacher reserve and to your suggestion that the, uh, these teachers be assigned to uh, schools. It, it does sound like a good idea mm -hmm. on the face of it, but in my conversations um, with principals, um, what's happened sometimes is when they take on the ATRs that they didn't really want, that sometimes those ATRs are really not in tune with their philosophy, are not um, uh, interested in carrying out the mission of the school, and they're in fact quite destructive to the mission. You, you should let me know where they are because I get a lot of principals saying, I have no ATRs and I really like them in my building. Could you help me? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
you think in general the ATR pool is not a problem? That, that, uh, I think yeah. it is something that could be used much more effectively at this point. And I think we're past the days. Remember, the, when it actually grew to over 1,000, I don't know. And, you know, here is the accountability and management, uh, Chancellor and Mayor. I don't know of an institution, if you need uh, 2,500 teachers, you go out and hire 4,000. And that was, is what was going on with the Department of Education. But I, mean, I think one of the cornerstones of um, uh, the new administration is that, or it's not new anymore, eight-year-old administration, is that principals should have some say mm -hmm. in hiring, and they shouldn't be assigned teachers um, according to seniority or against their will. <clears throat> we, we Look, we have worked with the Department of Ed to ha allow them to do some of the things that they, they thought ideologically and philosophically they wanted to do, but there comes a responsibility to manage the school system at the same time. And the increased numbers inside of the ATR pool were clearly the result of their inability to do what they told us they could do, which was manage the numbers properly. They chose not to. We were, we, I don't know how else, I mean, we wrote it down, we sent letters and everything else because we knew if they didn't manage this properly, if they didn't manage their HR, I mean, that's part of the school system is you have to manage your human resources. And they just continue to overhire when they should not have been. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to moderate myself and let Juan talk. But uh, <laughs> the the um, it, it, it seems to me um, with the ATR pool that there's a certain number. Of, one of the problems is that the teachers were hired years ago at very low salaries, with the promise that they would get good pensions, and that there are a certain number of people who are just counting the days to retirement. They feel that they really deserve that pension, and I agree with them that they probably do, um, but that they are really washed up and ready to retire. Wouldn't it make sense to have some kind of buyout for the ATR pool to give them a chance to I'll, get I'll sign, some of their... I'll co-sign any letter you want to send to the mayor on that. <laughs> uh, that is something... That is actually a provision we worked into the uh, ATR portion of our contract, is that they could offer them a buyout at any time they wanted. And they've, they have never done it, which is very frustrating to us. So I agree with you. I'm going to cut myself off and let Juan talk. I want to ask you about online learning. Online learning. Um, <laughs> our former chancellor uh, left and immediately went to work for uh, Rupert Murdoch. Uh, this will have a direct impact. <laughs> On the, on the nature of teaching and on your members. I'd like to see your sense of what uh, you envision to be the challenges, uh, the positives and the negatives of uh, teaching kids uh, largely through computers with no teachers in the classroom. Okay, online learning, it's a biggie. And yes, and th didn't you find it interesting that the person you went to work for then bought one of the companies that had a lot of contracts with the Department of Ed? That was just an aside. It's a coincidence, purely a coincidence. Um, education has done a horrendous job with technology. We're the only profession that as we adopt technology, we have actually made it a complete burden upon us. Uh, it's sad. And right now, uh, I was in um, a school yesterday and it was funny because they, they don't use ARIS anymore. Everybody knows what ARIS is. That's their online, the DOE system. And it's become, teachers constantly complain that it is nothing but a, a major burden on their workload. Because all it does is supply reams and reams of information, it does no analysis. So we now have a set of schools, about 120 approximately, who are using a system called Dedication. And it's a great system, and the teachers find it much more user friendly. And it is not owned by the Department of Education, they did not develop it, it was developed by others. In terms of online learning, we've done certain pilots at this point. Uh, where it's moving in this direction, everybody envisions that there are 500 kids sitting at a computer terminal and one teacher. That's how they're envisioning this. Well, it's never going to work that way. And people are starting to recognize this problem now. It sounds nice and it sounds very easy uh, as a solution, but it's not working. So teachers who are teaching in classrooms right now in a sort of online learning system have found that their workload has been greatly increased over 
their old teaching system without all of the online learning. So as we move forward... Why or how? Because you, the kids are actually producing more work that needs them to grade it, look at it, and analyze it because they can produce more. And they're doing things much differently. So as we're integrating technology, which is going to hopefully be a major boost for how we accelerate learning for children, and it really can be, we're going to have to figure out how to do it in a way and not let it be co-opted by people who just think we can have 500 kids and one teacher. It doesn't work that way. It's not going to work that way. What it does do is allow a teacher to let a student move farther and faster. And that's really where I see this moving. And that's my hope of online learning and education. Because as a child is doing a subject area, you can automatically put them into platforms where they can branch off into how there are other things that interact and connect with the subject that they're trying to learn at that moment. That allows them to produce more work, but at the same time, that then makes the teacher responsible for analyzing, grading, and giving guidance on the work that they did. So the real struggle for education is going to be how do we train all the teachers to understand how many, how many people in here understand how to navigate and use computers in a research format. Okay, so now we need about 85,000 teachers trained to do it because that is where it will go, and it should go there. But I don't see it as this great threat. And I have heard, and I've been at symposiums, where people talk about how we need to break into the market share on online learning and how we can do And I've heard people talk about 500 to 1 student to teacher ratios. And I was in Washington last week, and I said, have you seen a 500 to 1 student teacher ratio? And they say, no. I said, well, how are you telling people that you have a system that works that way? I said, so basically you're telling me that nobody's going to be looking at the student's work. And therefore, no real education is not going to happen. You're not going to have that give and take back and forth between teacher and student. I'm going to ask Errol to ask one question, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, there are people from the center who've got uh, cards that they're, yeah, Anna's there. Um, this is... I'm going to ask this really just from the point of view of consumers. I've, I've noticed a trend that is um, very disturbing that is, um, I think, uh, a big uh, challenge to the system, which is um, the defection, and I'll just talk about my neighborhood because it's the one I know best, uh, the, the defection of uh, black middle class parents from the public school system. Um, there was a time when many of them put their kids into church schools or to parochial schools. Mm -hmm. um, many of them are looking at close-in suburbs, if they can afford it. Right. Um, many of them are supporting and packing uh, anything resembling a shot at a private school education or a charter school education. Um, the loss of those parents and their concerns and their social capital and their education and their social networks from public education, I think, is a very, very grave threat. And it is because, as consumers, they see 10 years of bickering mm -hmm. and and um, they don't have 10 years to wait. Right. Um, many of the things that you've talked about sound like good ideas, but it sounds like another five-year round of back and forth between the, the teachers union and the, and the administration. What's, how do we get, I, I guess I'm not hearing from you a sense of emergency around this, because I see neighborhoods that can and will uh, falter and collapse mm -hmm. if these parents, uh, if these families uh, just walk out. I mean, you'll, you want to talk about high-needs students. That's all you're going to have yeah. in certain schools and in certain neighborhoods. It, it, uh, it is something that is a problem. Uh, I agree with you completely on this. We, you know, and when we still see... We do not want to continue to bicker and fight with the city administration. Really do not. Um, you know, as a teacher, I had a principal at one point who everyone was felt supported by and worked with, and our school moved forward. And then when we went in the opposite direction with new leadership, the school went also in the opposite direction. So I can understand parents saying, I don't want to hear this debate anymore. I'm really just, my concern is my child getting an education. And I have to my responsibility is to make sure that my child gets that good education. So we need to move 
in a direction so that parents start once again seeing that public education is real. I mean, the enrollment in, in the public schools still continues to go up every year. And it's projected to go up rather dramatically over the next 10 years. But if it's just high need students, of course those students need to be educated. But we have to be able to, as I said before, there are a lot of students who aren't high need and they want access to real schools that will do, allow their children to reach their highest goals. And anything that we can do to make that happen, I think is something you will see myself trying to make happen. Uh, when we changed the evaluation method last year in Albany, when we changed the 3020A process, those were things I felt so strongly about from the day I took presi the presidency. I knew that uh, we needed an evaluation method that included student achievement. That's very controversial amongst teachers. And as a new president, you know, one of the first things I did was change the evaluation method. Some of uh, the people at the union were quite concerned when I did it. I said, it's, it's not gonna work anymore. You need an evaluation method that truly is going to be fair and objective, but at the same time be a system that helps people always develop with the new skills because I can tell you this thing is what I do know. The teachers you're looking at right now who are successful are going to look much different in 10 years from now. And they are all gonna need all sorts of training. And if we don't have uh, the ability of the school system, we can't do a large training you're gonna to have to have that built into an evaluation method so that the schools where there are struggles and fights going on can automatically, that's a system-wide change that's going to force more collaborative work at the school level. And that's what I'm hoping that we see in more school system, in more schools. Because when you have a school that's in conflict, it's a horrible situation. It really is a horrible situation. Whether it's because you have a principal who doesn't have kids or you know, there's because you have a principal who's just a, a fearing for their job or you have a staff that's entrenched, it's a horrible situation and it's something that no parent wants to even look at. The parents are just like, I want my kid to get a good education. So we're going to continue to make the changes that we think systematically will allow more schools to move forward and to do that in a way that forces them to be more collaborative because to me, that's what really makes a difference in a school. When you see that, you see a school that moves forward. Now, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Um, Anna has the microphone, so you need to be recognized by her if you want to talk. Anna picks. <laughs> uh, <coughs> pardon. Uh, my name is Paul Mondesier. I'm uh, Director of Development for the City Kids Foundation. We work with at-risk high school students using the arts as a tool of engagement. I am here as a parent. I am a product of the New York City public school system. My daughter is a student who was uh, a student in, on the Upper West Side. I served on the Community Education Council, the first Community Education Council uh, representing District 3 in 04 and 05. Uh, I came to an understanding that uh, parents had no allies, uh, not in the UFT, not in the DOE, and for the most part, not in our schools. Uh, I am deeply frustrated because in this conversation, there's been very little talk about the children. There's been very little talk about what are real best practices that could and should be shared across the schools. I do not understand for the life of me, and I, I believe in teachers. I believe in good quality teachers. I believe in supporting them. I believe that... I don't think anybody in this room or in the administration at the DOE or at the mayor's office is thinking, oh, I want to really screw our kids. I don't think that's real. Mm -hmm. However, there is a real challenge that is not being addressed. What is happening with our children? When you were just talking about parents moving out of the school system, I, I understand that. I fought like hell to get my, excuse my language, I fought like heck to get my daughter into quality schools, into a solid elementary school, into a solid middle school, and into a solid high school. She's gotten a decent education, but that's because I manipulated the system to the best of my ability. Now, my, my question to, to you, Mr. Muldrew, and to anybody else in the room, is how are we going to help the children? It, to me, this is not about 
the teachers, uh, the, the union or the administration and what they're doing to manage or mismanage. It's what's gonna happen, how can we share best practices? Uh, one last thing, this is something that makes me a little bit crazy. Every kid is gifted and talented if they are well taught. Mm -hmm. I, I, it would make me very upset when I was in District 3 and hearing about, oh, the gifted and talented, gifted and talented. Yeah, okay. So your kid's bright. That's great. Is he as good in math as he is in social studies or science or music? No. He's a talented kid. All right, good. What about best practices to help bring out the best in those young people? That's, what I, uh, that's really the thing that I would like to hear you address. Best practices. I would absolutely support setting up a system where we share best practices among schools. We used to have some of that. It was never what it should have been. And maybe now we have the opportunity to do that. We do know certain schools do things for certain students better than anybody else. And right now, there is absolutely no sharing among schools. None. None. They don't share anymore. Um, as I spoke about the English language learners, that's a huge challenge that we face. We do know we have certain schools who are very successful with them. We need to get those practices shared. But it's not just about the high need students. It's what we need to be able to accelerate. It's not, you're, you're absolutely right about gifted and talented. All students should be looked at as gifted and talented because you're always trying to move them further and reach a higher goal. That's what gifted and talented is based upon. So we should look at every child in that way. And if we could create a system where we're sharing what we know works in one place so another place can try to replicate it, that would be something I'd be more than willing to try to help work it out because it's something that we find and we constantly say. We do a lot of it behind the scenes, wherever we can, between schools. But there is no systematic approach to it whatsoever anymore. Excuse me. So how do we make that happen? Because this is not brain surgery. There's mm -hmm. been good teaching going on. I look, yeah. I'm 50 years old now, and I, I had some great teachers. So how does that actually happen and it not be a, a discussion amongst academics who are interested? What, it, what, we would, what needs to happen then is to have, to just, have the city administration say, we're now going to help support a program that where we recognize best practices and we bring them to uh, schools that we know have those populations. You have to customize every school. Now, you Obviously, you're well informed on all of this. So every school has a unique set of needs based on its students, whether it's to accelerate or to re, you know, supply remediation or intervention. Every school has its own set of needs. So we have to, this is something you get your base funding, but we're no longer looking at a school and say, where's the educational plan that matches the needs of your students to what you're doing here? Where is the instructional practices, the programs that match the needs of the students inside of your building? So that we know that you're not just sit sitting on a lower, a, you know, a low bar that, that says your school's doing great. And that's really, that conversation would have to come from parents, from, uh, from teachers, and I'd be more than willing to have a much louder, broader conversation on this issue. It is something I feel very strongly about uh, because so much time is spent on the lowest performing students, which is real and has to happen, but the majority of the students in the school system are doing well, and we're not talking about how to accelerate their learning anymore. And I, that's very frustrating to me. And it's very frustrating to a parent. You want to know that that's happening. And I'd be more than willing to help anyone who wants to engage in that conversation on a, on a louder and more political basis to, with the D Department of Education and the city. And I think most people would agree with that. Andrew, it's hard do we not have to. time for one more question? Yeah, or a couple more, okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm Matt Molina. I'm a teacher. I have two questions. First is um, the DO used to, the Department of Education used to have a math and science curriculum department, mm -hmm. and they would send out um, emails with uh, professional devel development opportunities for teachers, yep. and uh, that no longer exists. So I wonder uh, if it's going to come back, or something uh, will replace it. And then my second question is under the 
I think you called it the fair funding formula. Yeah. Does that mean that um, a school cannot have a, a staff uh, fully staffed by experienced teachers because it would be too expensive? Okay, first one. Uh, I have heard no talk about reconfiguring recon any sort of department that does curriculum or subject professional development at the Department of Education. That's... Um, My understanding is that they've eliminated teaching and learning teaching at the and Department learning. of Education. All right. You're all filming this, right? So for the record, Clara said the Department of Ed no longer has teaching and learning. Um, I don't know how you reform a school system without an educational expertise, the uh, educational expertise knowledge base at the very central administration of the entire school system. That is, it's clear now that their, their reform is only based upon structure and not about instruction. And I don't know how you fix a school system just doing it through structure. It has to be a combination of the both. Let's get another couple of questions. I, I, Tom, give, oh, do I have, give Kathleen Cash in the mic, would you please? Yes. <laughs> Morning. Morning. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> Quickly, I have so much to say, but I'm gonna focus it. 332 was one of my schools. I was regional superintendent of Ocean Hill Brownsville. It was on the SIR list. We fixed it. We got it off the SIR list. Mm -hmm. It was in one of my schools when I was regional superintendent. The research, we tried to model ourselves somewhat like the Chancellor's District. To answer your question, sir. Prescriptive programs, a lot of school visitations. You'd get a $10,000 bonus to go and teach in the school, not a 10,000 bonus to get the, score, the test scores up. We had continuous professional development. The kids did it. And we did have a million, a million homeless shelters. And I said to my principals, it's our honor to serve the children who are battered, whose parents are battered. And the principals came around and we, we developed a plan where it wouldn't overly impact one school. The data on the Chancellor's District is significant. Mm -hmm. It was the most successful program in the nation for needy, needy children. Right now, we're third or fourth from the bottom nationally. The gap for African American children is widening. We can fix this, but we need to fix the schools. And when we do a program, it should be research-based. Not a quick fix, research-based. If you look at the stats on the Chancellor's District, we didn't lose one school when, we were super, when I was superintendent and my team we didn't lose one school to the Chancellor's District. We made sure, as the President said, the school matched the scores. You look in the school, you would see student work, teachers teaching. Karen knows, Karen's here, she knows. We were always in the schools. You've gotta have that hands-on approach. In terms of uh, online learning, you always need the human touch. Part of a child's development is that loving, caring adult to be there, to affirm them, to tell them they're doing great, not just a computer. I have a lot more to say, but I'm not going to. Thank you. Anna? Yeah. Hi, I'm Dominique House. I'm a second semester uh, urban policy student here in Milano. And um, the last couple years of my life, I hadn't planned on teaching, but I decided to go into teaching post undergrad after coming out of hip hop journalism. So <laughs> I ended up going to Honduras and I taught there for a year, came back to the United States, taught, taught in Milwaukee at an alternative to sanctions program uh, with at-risk teenagers. And then when I got to New York City, I actually worked at Harlem's Children's Zone in their after school program. And one issue is that I face is that these issues are more complex than I've ever imagined. Um, a lot of these kids are insecure. Um, a lot of them feel hopeless, um, a lot of them are confused, and a lot of them only attach themselves to these illusions that are projected in the media that I once supported. Um, so I guess my question is, what can we do as educators or people in the community to um, create, I guess, um, 
or to, to project that education is vital. A lot of these students don't feel like they need science in order to be successful. They don't feel like they need mathematics in order to uh, buy a Benz. And this is the psychology of a lot of children. So how can we um, affirm to these students that education is vital in the progression of their future? Engagement of the student is the most important thing that a teacher does, as you know. I'm sure your background kept them interested when you first walked in. All right. So, we, you know, people say, oh, the teacher, the test scores, it's engagement of a student. Uh, when I taught at risk, they said, you're an English teacher, why are you teaching filmmaking? I said, because my children will not rewrite an essay. But if I tell them to rewrite a script, and once I approve it, they can film it, they'll actually get access to the camera to make what their creation come to life on, on the screen, they'll rewrite that script 25 times because they're engaged in the learning process. And then they start to understand as their mind starts to develop and learn in all sorts of different ways, that eagerness, you see it light up in a student. That eagerness lights up. And so on one hand, you know, you, you know, everybody said, why do you teach at risk? I said, because I see a student who is completely disengaged in school and in where their future is going, and then I see them completely light up and get the fact that they are people, they are, they are someone of worth, they are someone who has creativity, and they can do wonderful things. And once you engage them in that education process, then it's, then it's your job to help them move as fast as they possibly can. And you don't hear people speak about education in that way. And that's really the heart of education. Engage the student. Analyze what's going to get them to move. That's the job of a teacher. And then sit there and nurture them and allow them to fly as high as they possibly can. And that's education. And whether it, we know we need to use research-based programs and really do smart decisions and all the rest of it, it comes back down to that classroom. And how do we facilitate the process I just described to happen in that classroom for each and every student is, is the real challenge we face you know, for the future of this city, this state, and this country. All right. I'm especially, I'm especially proud that one of our Milano students who gets the last question in, and such a good question. Um, I wanted to ask, actually, before we stop, I know we're running over a little bit, but I wanted to ask Errol and Juan if you had any last oh comment about this discussion. Yeah, uh, I'd like to say something about um, the, the issue of parents. Uh, I think one of the parents here raised what the, the frustration he's been feeling. Um, my wife is a high school teacher. She's been a high school teacher for the last 20 years, uh, 10 of them in the New York public school system and the last 10 in the suburbs. Uh, she worked under Mickens at Boys and Girls High for many years and Good several school. other schools in the city. And then she got frustrated and, and left for a very good high school in the suburbs. Um, and she has been astounded at the level of power that parents in suburban school districts have. They literally run their schools. And the administrators and the teachers live in fear of the parents and of the school board meeting. <laughs> and in the urban uh, school systems of America, the exact opposite has happened over the last 10 years. In fact, the parents have been totally disempowered. Uh, the decentralization system that we had in this city had many, many problems. Uh, but it was a grand experiment in democracy uh, because communities were able to, in one way or another, the active parents in those communities have a say in the running of their schools. Um, the reform that occurred uh, over the last 10 years was the largest removal of black and elected officials in the history of the country. Uh, all of these elected officials and all these school boards, and now we have a centralized system. I think the reality is New York City schools are too big to be run from a centralized place. Uh, 
every one of these little school districts is the equivalent of a school system someplace else. And yet the parents are now so far away from the people who exercise the decisions. Even the naming of the schools, the siting of the schools, you get these people from facilities management come with their, like, with their, their charts and their PowerPoint presentations <laughs> about what's the capacity of your school. They have no idea. Uh, you do, but they don't. Uh, and so this, uh, this, this centralization is bound to fail again. Uh, because it's, it, it's too much hubris, too many people thinking that they can determine all of these hundreds of schools and teachers and principals and how they should do things. Uh, and sooner or later we'll realize that, but the process, the parents have been totally alienated. Whereas before, under decentralization, at least they knew their local superintendent, they knew where the local school board meeting was, they could have a say, they might even be able to get a relative hired uh, at the local <laughs> school. Uh, that's all gone. Uh, in this grand reform of uh, mayoral control. Uh, and I think that uh, we're, we're all the sorrier for it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I, being slightly um, younger than my, my friend and mentor, Juan <laughs> Gonzalez, I, um, I see it a little bit differently. Um, I cut my eye teeth on writing about some of the corruption stories in District 17 where I live, in District 75 out in East New York. And it was a nightmare. Yeah, people could get hired, but you know what it took to get that and the cost to the system and to the kids was horrendous in many cases. There was, um, you know, I, I, District 17, you know, for those who remember it, very troubled. A third of the board members were from my Hasidic neighbors who had no kids in the system. A third were politicians with the local Democratic machine. And a third were, were people who were just trying to uh, do something for their neighborhood and were frustrated at every turn. Um, I, as, as I mentioned before in my other question to, to, to Mike, um, I, I really fear for the system. I really do. That, that there are people who are doing now what my dad did 50 years ago. He was a Harlemite. The schools were so bad there. He got on a train every day and went to Boys High in Brooklyn. Um, he put us in parochial school when he couldn't afford it as a New York City cop. He moved us out after 10 years of, of trying that and slowly going broke doing that. He moved us out to the suburbs, you know, and... Um, fast forward 40 years, I've got a five-year-old and I'm confronted with almost exactly the same problems in the same neighborhood, with the same bad choices, with the same expensive choices to pay a bunch of property taxes in the suburbs or to pay a bunch of private school tuition here or to fight with a system that seems to have no interest in me whatsoever. So uh, I, I think, you know, and this is just uh, what I was getting at before, Mike, was in any task, whether you're trying to figure out how to lose weight or... Uh, learn something, there's a time limit that has to be attached to it, and you do the best you can with the time that you have. And so, while what you said is true, and I'm sure your members love it, it's chilling to me to hear that, look, Kathy Black's gonna be gone, Mike Bloomberg's gonna be gone, and we're still gonna be here, being the UFT. Well, you know, a lot of parents are gonna be gone, and a lot of families are gonna be gone, and a lot of kids are gonna have missed their chance at an education. And um, I'm hoping, as I think a lot of parents are, that we can add some sense of urgency and time compression to this and to do the best we can with the time that we have because the time for many of us is not infinite. Thank you very much, Juan Gonzalez, Errol Lewis, and Clara, and Michael Mulgrew for coming out. And thanks to all of you for coming. This was great.